This is an auto-narrated audiobook by Google's computer-generated AI voices. Only Lily by Una Ryda is the second book in the Cottonwood Falls Lunchtime Read series. To ensure the authors on this channel are able to bring you more free content, please support them by subscribing to the channel. Copyright 2023 by Lovestruck Romance, all rights reserved. Chapter 1 Eric is hands down the worst fiancé ever. Is your friend gone? His monotone conveys disinterest as he remains engrossed in the game on his phone. She left five minutes ago. I don't know what's going on with Mia. We've lost touch and since this is the first time I've been back home in Cottonwood Falls in four years, I was hoping we could catch up. But our short visit was bizarre, to say the least. I huff in exasperation. Could you at least try to feign some interest in me? And not be so rude to my family and friends? Listen, sweetheart, you knew what you were getting when you blackmailed me into being a pawn in your ludicrous scheme. Blackmailed is a harsh word. I call them as I see them. Three weeks ago, I was lounging on my balcony in LA reading an online newspaper when I saw a syndicated human interest piece from Cottonwood Falls. My blood ran cold at the picture of the man whose stern expression was staring straight at the camera, Bo Abernathy. All the feelings that I've tried for years to bury rose to the surface. The caption read, Hometown Hero Founds Charitable Foundation, and for the first time in years my eyes filled with tears. I skimmed a few words of the article, enough to know that Bo was the so-called hero and he was back home fulfilling our dream, the one he and I created together. Only he was doing it without me. As I sat in my condo staring at the newspaper photo of Bo, I did something that I utterly despise. I felt sorry for myself. I wallowed in self-pity at the injustice, at my unfulfilling career, at my non-existent love life, at my everlasting heartache. All because of that lying, cheating snake in the grass Bo Abernathy. That's when my revenge plot was hatched. It's not all roses and sunshine for me either, I snap at Eric. I'm the one who has to sleep next to you. The corner of his mouth lifts in amusement. You're the first woman to complain about sharing a bed with me. Spare me. I pretend to stick my fingers in my ears. I don't care to hear about your between-the-sheets exploits thank you very much. And we may be sharing a bed tonight, but I better not feel so much as your pinky toe cross over to my side. Trust me. He scoffs. My pinky toe doesn't want to feel you either. Eric is a young, hot new director that the film industry is raving about. They're calling him the next Spielberg. He's also a friend of mine. Was a friend of mine. Not quite sure what he is at the moment besides my fiancé. Eric, I deserve closure. I deserve. Vengeance. I shake my fist in the air. I want him to drown in regret. I want him to rue the moment he chose to forsake me. Eric rolls his eyes. Actresses. So dramatic. The best revenge on an ex is to show them you're happy, or so they say. That's why Eric and I are here in Cottonwood Falls, to show off my thriving career, successful fiancé, and wedding of the century. It would be more effective if you really were happy. He comments dryly. Before I can respond, a timid, mousy waitress with a starstruck look in her wide eyes approaches our table. Seconds tick by awkwardly. Finally, realizing she's tongue-tied, I smile encouragingly. Hello? You must be our server tonight. Miss? Miss Kent. She clears her throat and tries again. Hello, Miss Kent. Even before I had a starring role in a blockbuster movie, I was a regular on the beauty pageant circuit. My mom had me strutting down runways from the time I could walk, and I never take fans for granted. Please call me Lily, I say graciously. My eyes narrow. Do I know you? Um, I'm Kara Manning. A shadow crosses Kara's face before she continues. I'll be working for the caterers at your wedding this weekend. She clasps a hand over her heart. It'll be the biggest best event in Cottonwood Falls since, since, the pumpkin festival in 2019 when Cletus Buckthorn grew that nearly 2,000-pound pumpkin. Yes, this is the kind of response I'd hoped for when I made the phone call to Tippy Turlington, Cottonwood Falls wedding planner, telling her to put together the last-minute wedding of the century. After I place my order and it's Eric's turn, I notice something odd. Eric has been sour since the moment we entered LAX to board our plane to Kansas. He hates this farce of a marriage, and he's been surly, rude, and dismissive of everything and everyone. 
But right now, instead of staring at his cell phone screen, Mousy Kara has his full, rapt attention. I swear his lips even mouth the word, Kara. He smiles at her and displays a charm I've never seen from him. In fact he doesn't take his eyes off her, not even when she turns and heads to the kitchen, tripping clumsily over her feet on the way. Nope. Not happening. Hate to be a cock blocker. Eric can sleep with whomever he wants, after our wedding. The last thing I need is gossip about a philandering fiancé. Eric, I hiss. I'm warning you. Play along and I'll keep your secret. If you blow this, your name will be mud in the industry. I'll let the world know who you really are. The change in his features is spine tingling, and he turns to me with a death stare that chills my bones. Careful, sweetheart. I'll only let you push me so far. His words are laced with menace. Then he breaks into a sinister grin. You don't want to find yourself sleeping with the fishes. Chapter 2 Merv's in the storeroom running inventory, and Angie's deep frying my breakfast in the kitchen. My eyes are glued to the invitation lying on the bar. There's a sparkly gemstone in the middle, a diamond. It's probably real. You've been staring at that thing for two days, my brother Dean announces. Because I can't believe she'd invite me to her wedding after the shit she pulled. I shake my head. She's got bigger cojones than some of the guys I served with. At first, I thought the wedding invitation that was hand-delivered two days ago was a mistake, but no. The envelope is addressed to Bocephus Abernathy care of Bo's bunkhouse. It's today. Dean leans an elbow on the bar. Maybe you should go. Are you kidding me? Please tell me you're kidding. When I returned from the Middle East, Lily Kent was all over the tabloids. And while the physical pain as I was laid up in the hospital and going through months of rehab was immense, the pain of seeing photos of her sleeping her way around Hollywood was unbearable. It got to the point where I threatened a merciless ass-whopping to anyone who dared speak her name in my presence. Then this invitation. Bro, you ain't fooling no one. I know you never got over her. What? I want nothing to do with that snooty stuck-on-herself nose-in-the-air phony. Is that why you turn down women left and right? You get more phone numbers shoved in your pocket than half the men in town combined, and you get less bedroom action than any of them. You're just jealous because I'm prettier than you. My brother Dean and I are identical twins, and I can't explain why women do what they do. Don't you get tired of your own fist? At least I can trust my own fist not to stab me in the back. All I'm saying. Dean stops mid-sentence when Angie pushes through the swinging door with my mozzarella sticks. It's no secret Dean's not her biggest fan. After she returns to the kitchen, I attempt to resume the conversation. Anyway. Dean cuts me off by placing a finger to his lips. Then he slides off his bar stool, moves silently to the door and slams a fist into it. Ow. Angie shouts as the door smacks her in the face. Quit eavesdropping. Dean snarls. Mind your business and get back to work. Screw you, Dean. That chick is bad news. He shakes his head in disgust. Told you to stay away from her. She needed a job. What was that you said again? The thing about getting backstabbed. He raises a brow pointedly. And she's harmless. And she makes some mean mozzarella sticks, I say crunching down on one. Dean rolls his eyes at my breakfast of champions. No one wants to eat six string cheeses in a row, but you deep fry them and serve them with tomato sauce, and suddenly they're a hot menu item. My gym rat brother is a health nut. Quit knocking my breakfast and have yourself another tumbler of grass juice. Anyhow, he knocks his knuckles on the bar. I'm out of here. I'll just leave you with one parting word of wisdom, closure. Closure. Dean has a point. I never did get closure. And that is how I find myself at 10 in the morning, standing just inside the tree line of the wooded area behind the Kent's sprawling mansion, with my jeep in a nearby clearing, watching last-minute wedding preparations like a creepy stalker. I can't explain my sneaking onto the property, rather than simply ringing the doorbell. Maybe I don't want to admit even to myself, much less the Kent's and the wedding guests, that I'm here to demand answers like a sorry loser. I want to know what the hell happened four years ago. There was an engagement ring in my pocket that night, for Christ's sake. The night she ghosted me. The next morning my unit was deployed to Afghanistan, and I left with a gaping hole in my chest that's never healed. I stood waiting all night out on the bluffs, my heart torn out, tromped on, spit on, and ground to dust. 
Dean's right, I haven't been the same since, and I need answers. My leg is throbbing, but injury or not, I was trained for covert ops, to get in and out undetected. The backyard is abuzz with activity, which is not ideal. I should have come last night. I'll have to use the chaos to my advantage. Caterers, florists, groundspeople, and whoever else are bustling around too busy to notice an intruder. Trying to hide my limp, my military training comes in handy as I stride across the lawn with an air of purposeful intent. I know how to blend in and go unnoticed. In this case the trick is to act as though I'm supposed to be here, and move at the same frenetic pace as all the others darting around. It works. I'm able to maneuver stealthily around the house, find the best entry and exit points, and even take a clandestine tour through the Kent's massive winding home. Creeping down a darkened corridor of a nearly empty wing of the mansion, I'm caught off guard, when a door to one of the rooms suddenly opens behind me. Instinctively, I flatten my frame against the wall and hold my breath as a young woman wearing a shy smile emerges. Her hair is tousled, her cheeks are flushed, and her catering uniform is disheveled. I'm relieved when she doesn't notice me, and instead heads down the hall in the opposite direction. What happens next fills me with confusion, shock and I'll admit, anger. Following the woman, in a similar state of disarray, as he adjusts his waistband, fixes his bow tie, and dons his tuxedo jacket, is a man I recognize from my Google search. He's the groom. Eric Vandenberg. Lily's fiancé. Chapter 3 so far this revenge plot I've cooked up has been anticlimactic. Maybe instead of an elaborate payback plan, I should have just stayed in LA and called Bo. Right, phone a guy you haven't seen in years to ask him why you weren't enough for him. Good idea, Lily. Then you can ask him how his wife and kid are doing. Bo used to call me goddess. And I melted every time. I was such a sucker. One of Adele's heart-wrenching ballads echoes through my parents' cavernous bathroom as I step out of the marble shower enclosure and wrap myself in a thick, fluffy towel. Today is the day of the big farce. My wedding. It's a grand event. Much different from the cozy ceremony out on the bluffs that I'd dreamed of having years ago. Years ago, when I was a naive love-struck fool. After toweling off, I slather myself with scented lotion, slip into a robe and bend at the waist to blow-dry the underside of my hair. By Hollywood standards, this will be a moderate wedding. By Cottonwood Falls standards, it's ginormous. When I flip upright, I almost scream. My heart beats a staccato rhythm against my ribcage. Bo Abernathy, my mortal enemy, is leaning casually against the doorframe as though he hasn't a care in the world. Hi there, goddess. My nipples harden and my breath hitches. I hate the butterflies in my chest when he calls me that. I want to tell him to stop, but I can't seem to form the words right now. What, what are you doing here? I wish my voice was steadier. His gaze sweeps the length of my body and his eyes grow heated. The real question is what are you doing? I swallow. This is what you want, Lily. This is why you went to so much effort. It's my wedding day. I'm preparing to enter into wedded bliss. He smirks. Listening to breakup music while your husband-to-be is balls deep in the caterer? Sounds like bliss to me. Damn, the years have been good to him. Bo always was handsome, but he's lost his boyishness. His features are more defined, more masculine, and his all-black clothing clings to his muscled form. He's still the only man who has ever made my body come alive. Yours and probably a dozen other women, I think to myself. Answer the question, Bo. Why are you here? Well, let's just say I came to offer my congratulations. By sneaking into my bedroom? How do you know I didn't walk in through the front door? I flash him a you-must-be-kidding-me look. His face grows somber. What are you doing, goddess? Emotions toward the door. What are you doing marrying that guy? None of your business, I say flippantly, devoid of the satisfaction I'd hoped to feel. Instead, there's a bitter taste in my mouth. Like bile. You need to leave. I've had hair and makeup people flown in for the occasion, and they'll be arriving soon. Goddess. When he takes a step forward, I see pity in his gaze. Pity. It makes me want to punch him right in his chiseled jawline. Don't call me that. Don't you dare call me that. Interesting. Bo cocks a brow. You hardly react when I tell you your intended is slipping the sausage to a caterer a few hours before you're set to walk down the aisle but you see red when I call you goddess. That's your idea of wedded bliss? The sarcastic jerk. He's right though. 
Losing my temper is not beneficial. I reach for my zen reminding myself that I'm an actress, and a damn good one. What do you care? You lost the right to comment on my life when you betrayed me. Betrayed you? I betrayed you. That's right. And speaking of betrayal, what would your wife say about you being here? My stomach clenches when I say that word. As much as I hate Beau, there's still a pathetic part of me that hurts like hell when I think of him with a wife who's not me. His brow furrows. Woman, what the hell are you talking about? That LA smog must be clogging your brain. I'm talking about you doing me dirty, that's what. That night, I pause and look away when what feels like a boulder lodges in my throat. Yeah, let's talk about that night. His voice drips with disdain and I don't think I can do this anymore. Even summoning all my acting ability, I can't seem to pull off casual or detached with him. You need to leave, Bo. His fists clench and his cool demeanor evaporates. You could have told me to my face instead of ghosting me. He runs a hand through his hair. What was it? A soldier doesn't make enough money for you. Not enough rungs on my ladder for you to social climb. How dare you? How dare you say that? I can't believe this. He's implying that I'm somehow at fault? Get out. Get out right now. I want an answer first. And I want you gone. His eyes darken ominously. Good. I shouldn't be the only one fuming. Bocephus Abernathy, you are the most low-down double-crossing rat fink I've ever met. Warning bells go off in the back of my head, but I'm too enraged to pay attention to them. Leave. His face is contorted in rage as he takes a step forward. It's rather frightening, if I'm being honest, and I take a step back. His jaw clenches and his nostrils flare. He steps forward again. He reminds me of a bull about to charge a red flag, and I retreat until my back is pressed to the bathroom wall. He continues to advance. What, what are you doing? I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm leaving. He spits out angrily. And you are coming with me. Chapter 4 Lily is every bit as beautiful as I remember. More so. I have to keep reminding myself that she's nothing but an overly ambitious, career-driven, social-climbing opportunist. She's obviously marrying that movie director to advance her career. She can't love him. She didn't bat an eye when I told her that I caught him with another woman on their wedding day. I clamp a hand over her mouth, haul her over my shoulder, and stomp out of the room with her flailing wildly. She tries to bite my hand but she can't get her teeth around it. Her screaming is muffled but not silent. Shish. I don't want to bruise this pretty face of yours, goddess. Quiet down. It doesn't work. She kicks her feet and pounds her fists but she stops and grabs onto my shirt when I pretend I'm going to drop her. The home has a back staircase for live-in domestics and while the Kents employ hired help they're not live-ins since this back wing is mostly unfurnished and unoccupied with the exception of Lily's fiancé, who was back here not long ago tapping the caterer. I've lost my mind. Clearly, I'm not considering the consequences. The only thoughts in my head are that I haven't gotten answers, and that someone needs to save Lily from making a grave mistake. Instead of shutting up of course, Lily thrashes violently and attempts to project her screams. My chest shakes with silent laughter. Some things haven't changed. She's still a firecracker. I have to remove my hand from her mouth to do it, but I smack her ass hard. It's a quick stinging slap that leaves her too shocked to continue screaming. Told you to be quiet. No one can hear you back here anyway. Her eyes widen in disbelief and her cheeks turn pink with rage. I'm in a state of disbelief myself. It's a miracle I managed to carry her through the house, skirt the edge of the property with her over my shoulder, and arrive at my vehicle without being noticed. By the time I drop her down in the jeep, my leg feels as though I've been kneeling on shards of glass. She scowls up at me from the passenger seat. You bastard. She hisses. What do you think you're doing? What am I doing? Hell if I know. All I know is that I can't bear the thought of Lily marrying that cheating jerk. Why isn't anyone looking out for her? Where's her brother Logan? Why isn't he stopping this farce? A little voice in the back of my head is screaming, you're a total dumbass. I lean in. You and I need to have a conversation. Right now. Today. I'll have you back to your hair and makeup people in no time. Her bottom lip protrudes in a sexy pout, and I have a strong urge to take it between my teeth and lick it. 
as I round the jeep, I half expect her to jump out and take off running. Surprisingly, she doesn't. She glowers out the side window as we drive silently through town. When we pass Bo's bunkhouse, I see a flicker of interest from her, but she doesn't say anything, so I do. That's my place there. If she wasn't barefoot and dressed in nothing but a bathrobe, I'd stop and we could talk in my office. Under the circumstances, I have another spot in mind. I'm still not sure what I'm doing. Surely when Dean suggested I seek closure, he didn't expect his sane rational twin to abduct a bride-to-be in broad daylight. Lily's the only person who inspires me to act like a raving lunatic. Her eyes are narrowed and she's lost in thought. We leave the town center and drive another ten minutes or so down a deserted country road. Lily is subdued now, and I think I made a huge mistake. Do I even want to know why she dumped me? Lily was just sixteen when she decided we were destined. That was how she put it too, destined. Always dramatic. Even then she had beauty, grace and poise. A pageant queen. But I was twenty-one, and to me she was just a teenager with a crush. She could have had any boy she wanted, but she picked me, a backwoods orphan boy without a dime to his name who spent his days tromping through the woods barefoot in someone else's cast-off clothing and beating up anyone who dared poke fun at him or his brothers. But she cried when I enlisted and wrote me faithfully. It was her letters and emails that did it. They revealed a sweet, vulnerable, tender-hearted young woman, and by the time Lily was seventeen, she was officially my girl. When I came home on leave, I went straight to see Lily. I even stayed at her family's home sometimes. Good people. Always like the Kents. She'd just turned eighteen when we learned my unit was being deployed to an active combat zone, and she wanted me to take her virginity that night. I wanted her to wear my ring. Neither ever happened. She chose Tinseltown instead, parties and galas and premieres, while I fought enemy combatants and acquired a permanent limp. Dumbass, I scold myself. I have to remember she's not the sweet, kind-hearted Lily I fell in love with. Even so, she deserves better than that lecherous prick. When she recognizes her surroundings, her eyes fly open wide and her body stiffens. Where are you taking me? Where do you think? Her jaw drops, her eyes burn with rage and her chest heaves. She's about to combust. Oh, I miss this. I'm grinning. I can't help it. Being this close to Lily, even if she wants to rip my head off, is the first time I've felt alive in years. Just when I think she's about to tear into me, she gasps, dives across the console, and grabs the steering wheel with both hands. Watch out. Chapter 5 I lunge for the wheel with every ounce of my adrenaline-fueled super strength and yank it hard to the right. Lily. Bo slams on the brakes. Tires squeal. He attempts to redirect the vehicle, but it's too late. The jeep skids off the road, rolls down an embankment, and careens headlong into a thick oak. The crash is deafening. There's a lengthy silence as we sit inhaling the plastic aroma of deployed airbags. Bo is so still that at first, I think maybe he's dead. But his eyes are open, his jaw clenches and unclenches, and a vein in his forehead is throbbing. He's not dead. Good. I may hate him, but I don't want him dead. Squirrel, I croak out into the otherwise stunned silence as I stare through a shattered windshield and mangled tree bark. He's still facing straight ahead. When he finally speaks, his voice is strained. I've had extensive military training in defensive driving and avoiding road hazards. He doesn't look at me, but his square jaw continues to tick. I could easily have maneuvered around the rodent. His voice picks up in volume as he speaks. Without my jeep being wrapped around a tree. I wince. Oops. Pushing aside the deployed airbag, Bo reaches into his back pocket, removes his cell phone and glances at it before palming his forehead. No service. I already know the answer. This whole area is too far from the nearest cell tower to receive a signal. We're in a dead zone. How do I know? Because Bo was taking me to the bluffs, and I can hardly believe his nerve. It was our spot. When he was home from the military, he'd bring me to the bluffs often. It was where we came to talk, to relax, to make out, and it was where we planned to consummate our relationship that night. It was also where he ruined our perfect love. He breathes out a loud exhale, then gets out and examines the damage briefly before rounding to the back, removing a wool blanket, then continuing on to open the passenger door. I guess none of those defensive driving courses prepared you for Lily Kane, did they? 
I joke, attempting to ease the tension. My humor falls flat. Wordlessly, he unlaces his black boots and slides them off his feet. Turn. He bites out harshly. Confused, I do as he says, dangling my feet above the running board. The stink of the airbag is getting to me anyway. What are you doing? His words emerge softer this time. We're approximately 10 miles from town on an infrequently traveled road with no cell service for miles. He slides one of his boots onto my foot, tugs the laces tight and ties it before moving to my other foot. We have no choice but to walk. 10 miles? Oh, brother. I'm not sure my sporadically attended hot yoga classes have prepared me for a 10-mile hike through the wilderness. It's only four miles to a cabin with a phone. He helps me out of the jeep, and I hate that the nearness of Bo does something unsettling to me. Something as exciting and as pleasurable as it is painful. I yank my hand out of his, my body humming with awareness. I hate myself for it, but I can't seem to turn it off. The only reason I stopped struggling and played along with this abduction is because before Bo appeared in my bedroom, my revenge plot was at a standstill. I admit I saw red when he hauled me out to his jeep, but after my initial outrage, I figured I could use this opportunity to my advantage and make Bo Abernathy eat his heart out with jealousy and rue the day he ever double-crossed me. Bo begins walking into the woods and motions for me to follow. I don't. Um, shouldn't we walk along the road? Bo's in his socks and I'm wearing a mid-thigh length kimono style robe and combat boots, which would be a cute outfit if the boots weren't four sizes too big. He scowls at me. I know a shortcut. His words are brittle and clipped, and I don't want to be around him like this. Not an angry Bo. Not a happy Bo, either. Not any Bo unless he's on his knees drowning in regret and choking on the words of his own apology, so I head up the embankment that leads to the road instead. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to wait for a car and hitch a ride. Duh. I huff derisively. Is that so? On a road that gets an average of a vehicle every three days? He's smirking. He's enjoying this. We're stranded in the wilderness and he's enjoying himself. I'll take my chances. Suit yourself. He shrugs and keeps walking. Have fun after dark when the bears, wolves, and mountain lions prowl. Bears? Wolves? Mountain lions? Retracing my steps, I scurry along behind him. Hey, I'd rather swallow my pride than be mauled. Bo walks with a limp. I want to ask him about it, but it's not my business. His ass is as fine as ever though. In school, rumors about Bo seeing other girls behind my back made their way to me almost weekly, but I'm used to catty nastiness. In the pageant circuit, petty jealous bitches are everywhere, and I stubbornly ignored the rumors, swearing my Bo was honorable, steadfast, and loyal. What a fool I was. Bo asks me one more time condescendingly what I'm doing marrying that guy, and I tell him to bite me. After that we walk in silence, trudging for what feels like hours through the falling leaves of early autumn. I want to ask about the children's charity he founded, and it's on the tip of my tongue when Bo stops suddenly. His brows knit together as he looks around. What's going on? I ask. He scratches his head. We're lost. Chapter 6 We'll make camp here, I tell her, tossing the blanket on the ground. You stay put while I rustle us up some grub. Grub? She blinks rapidly. How? I point through the trees to the creek a few yards away. Fishing. Lily's nose wrinkles, and her horrified eyes stare down at the wool blanket. There's no mani petties or caviar and champagne brunches out here, sweetheart. We're roughing it, I call out over my shoulder as I stride to the creek, trying not to laugh. It's funny how easily she bought the lie that we were lost. As if I could get lost in my own backyard. Tossing my socks on a rock, I roll up my pant legs and wade out to a large boulder. Noodling flathead catfish barehanded can be messy, but the fish are tasty and I've seen a few 20 or 30 pounders out here. Many times my brothers and I relied on these woods to provide for us, and it doesn't take me long to find a hole, jam my hand into it, and pull out a nice sized fish. I'm just about to wade over to a fallen log when I hear a blood curdling scream. Bolting out of the water, I race to the clearing, ignoring the pain in my leg. Where's Lily? I told her to stay put. Another ear splitting scream rends the air, and my heart beats so hard it might crack a rib. Following the sound back to the creek, downstream from where I was fishing, I see Lily scrambling up the bank, buck ass naked and screaming like a banshee. 
she runs straight into my open arms. What is it, goddess? Her fist ball my shirt and her chest heaves. It's a snake. Looking out at the water, I don't see anything swimming, but I know there are rattlers and copperheads out here. Hush. I stroke her hair as she trembles in my arms. Did it get you? No. I wanted to wash off from the hike. She huffs a self-deprecating laugh. Leave it to me to end up skinny dipping with serpents. Something I always liked about Lily is her easy laughter, even at herself. Then it hits me. Skinny dipping. Lily is in my arms, pressed up against me naked. I should release her. But as I look down, she looks up, and our eyes meet. There's desire in her heavy-lidded gaze, and the blood flow to my brain instantly reroutes straight to my cock. Her lips part on a shallow exhale, and when her tongue darts out to moisten them, resistance is futile. I kiss her like we're still madly in love. She tastes just like I remember, even better. As my tongue delves into the sweet recesses of her mouth, we cling to each other, lost in passion. With her perfect curves flush against me, lust pulses through my veins. This woman. She's the only one who can drive me wild with need. My hand reaches down palming the soft globe of her ass cheek. It's been so long. The last time I felt her in my arms was... Fuck. This was not part of the plan. I don't know who breaks away first, but we both step back panting wildly. Swiping an angry palm down my face, I clear my throat. I didn't. That wasn't. Her fancy robe is on the ground and I pick it up, awkwardly draping it around her shoulders. Go back to the clearing, I say, unable to hide my gruff tone. Lily is tying the belt on her robe, looking as flustered as I feel. I caught us a catfish. We'll cook it over a campfire, before we hunker down for the night. The blood drains from her face. We're going to sleep out here? Unless you see a holiday inn around here somewhere, I say sarcastically. I don't bother to wait for a response. I have a raging hard on and need to get the hell out of here before I do something stupid about it. In no hurry to return, I sit on the bank chastising my dumb self. Did I really think forcing Lily to miss her wedding would finally bring me closure? Yeah, I guess I did. But revenge is not as satisfying as I'd hoped. She's not the beauty queen with a heart of gold anymore. She's a soulless spoiled brat who barely reacted to her fiancé banging another woman. Hell, Lily probably has a lineup of lovers on the side herself. She's a fame whore now, and I was better off with her out of my life. My cabin is a five-minute walk from here. I'll drive her home in my SUV. Scooping up the catfish, I arrive at the clearing surprised to find Lily hunched over a pile of dry sticks, dead leaves, and dehydrated moss blowing gently, nurturing a small flame. You started a fire? I'm momentarily stunned. Grinning proudly, she motions to the ground. I made a hand drill with a twig and one of your shoelaces, and rubbed it over a tinder nest of dried moss. I stare dumbfounded. Don't look so stunned, she quips. We have YouTube in LA too. Unbelievable, I mumble shaking my head. I got skills. She blows on her fingernails and polishes them on her robe. You do remember I was Miss Cottonwood Falls Pumpkin Festival six years running, right? I believe that's still a record. There she goes again, laughing at herself. What do we do now? She asks excitedly. I try not to smile. But her enthusiasm is infectious. I should take her back to the Kents. Right now. I should but I just can't seem to do it. Not yet. I pull out my pocket knife. Now you sit yourself down while I clean and cook this fish. So many nights I lay awake, wishing I could purge all memories of Lily from my mind. Turns out I did forget something. When I hatched this spur-of-the-moment scheme thinking it'd be funny to watch her rough it in the wilderness, I forgot something fundamental. Never underestimate Lily Kane. Chapter 7 I kissed a married man. With tongue. That was a huge mistake. Sure, back in LA I'd fantasized about entangling Bo in my web of seduction. Making him cheat on his wife. Giving her a taste of her own medicine, and maybe that makes me a bad person, but I don't care. It's karma. I forgot about Bo's child though. The thought of an innocent child sustaining collateral damage from my actions sours my stomach. I won't allow it. I adore children, and I'm not a homewrecker. 
Nothing like that kiss can happen again, and if we're going to camp out under the stars tonight, I have to keep hating him. After Bo cooks catfish on a flat stone in the fire, we sit eating it with our fingers. It's fun and my emotions are all jumbled because it's hard to remain surly and churlish. He winces when he bends his leg to lower himself to the ground. Your leg. Um. What happened? Our Hummer was clipped by an IED in Afghanistan. Bo was hurt in an explosion? No one told me. Maybe because I forbade my family from even mentioning him. Throughout high school, while my friends worried about exams and cheerleading tryouts and curfew, my biggest fear was that Bo would come home in a box. We all made it out. He continues as my appetite vanishes. But I had to carry my buddy on my back for a couple of miles to safety, and it did irreversible damage to my already injured knee. Oh, I say quietly. Shame washes over me when I remember scoffing at the newspaper article referring to him as a hometown hero. He is a hero. I feel a momentary twinge of pride before it occurs to me that I have no right to feel pride. Bo's not mine. He belongs to someone else now. I bet your wife's proud, I mumble, cringing at how snide it sounds. As he lifts a piece of fish, his hand stops halfway to his mouth and his eyes narrow into slits. Wife? That's the second crack from you today about a wife I don't have. That shocks me. You don't have a wife? You think I'd be out here with you if I did? Are you? Divorced? Never married. Then his penetrating gaze bores into me with a look so cold it turns my blood to ice. He huffs a humorless laugh. Came close once. I don't get it. He never married the mother of his child but they came close? I wonder what happened. No I don't. I really don't. Don't ask Lily. It's none of your business Lily. Keep your mouth shut Lily. What about your? Um. Child. Bo coughs so long and hard I think he'll hack up a lung. The catfish must have gone down wrong. I slap him on the back as his face turns red, and when he's able to catch his breath he wheezes out. Child. What child? When he stands to clean up and toss the fish carcass and guts back into the creek, I ponder what might have happened. All this time, I assumed he was married. I also assumed he had a child. I guess it's true what they say about assuming. The thought that his child must have been miscarried fills me with sympathy. As Bo gathers a pile of leaves and spreads the blanket on top of them, I touch his arm to offer my solace and condolence. I'm so sorry, I say with the utmost sincerity. His brow furrows. Why does he look as though I'm an escapee from the loony bin? You okay, goddess? As he stares, I involuntarily shiver. You're cold. I glance down at my thin kimono robe and yawn. The sun's going down. He nods and sits on the blanket with his legs extended and his back against a tree. We'll have to huddle for warmth tonight. He gestures for me to sit between his legs. Come here. I shoot him one of my you gotta be kidding me looks. Bo sighs. There's only one blanket so no matter how we do it, we're sleeping together tonight to conserve body heat. It's basic survival. He's right. I'm being silly. I yawn again and crawl over between his legs. He wraps me in his arms. Despite my fatigue, being this close to Bo makes my body hum with need. He's not married. I didn't kiss a married man. Why does that make me want to kiss him again? If I do, I won't stop at just a kiss. I'm so horny, my vagina's about to combust and my nipples have contracted into hard little points. When I feel the steel rod in his black cargo pants, I inhale audibly. It's just biology, he says. Ignore it. But I don't want to ignore it. Why shouldn't I get my itch scratched? Do I really want to go back to LA still a virgin? No I don't. Bo's the only man I've ever been so attracted to that I lose my mind with lust, so why not? Why shouldn't he be my first? It won't make me a homewrecker, and I decide right then and there that Bo and I are going to happen. I yawn again. Walking through the woods all day can sure take it out of a person. If I wasn't so tired, I'd seduce Bo. I'm definitely seducing Bo. When I'm not so tired. Suddenly, I remember something he said earlier. What if a mountain lion or bear tries to attack us in our sleep? I ask. I shiver again and he wraps the ends of the blanket around us, keeping me warm against his chest and rubbing his hand up and down my arm. Don't worry about that. I got you. Don't worry? 
Bo always was tough. All the Abernathy boys are, but surely he can't fight off wild animals with his bare hands. What are you going to do? I ask, unable to keep my eyes open another second. I'm half asleep when he says, Hush, I'm going to protect you, goddess. Then as I drift off, I'm not sure but I think I hear him whisper, If you were my wife, I'd never share you. Chapter 8 Lily rubs the sleep from her eyes as I extinguish the fire and stretch my leg muscles like I learned in physical therapy. I wasn't a virgin when I met Lily, but I haven't been with a woman since, and remaining awake all night with her in my arms left me with the worst case of blue balls in the history of mankind. Nothing has been resolved, and I haven't gotten closure. If anything, the ache in my chest is worse. I shouldn't have held her all night, but I couldn't resist. Lily affects me in a way no other woman on the planet does. I need to get her home. Which direction are we headed today? West, I grumble. The terrain is easily traversable, and it's only a few minutes before we reach my cabin. Lily is staring down at the huge boots and struggling to walk in them without tripping, so she doesn't notice it until we reach the front porch. She looks up and gasps. What is this place? It's my cabin. Her mouth hangs open, and I have to push her a little to get her moving up the steps. You call this a cabin? I thought you meant a hunter's shack. This is a gorgeous home. I have to admit, I find her awestruck expression flattering. I gesture toward the bathroom. You can shower while I call a tow truck. Afterward I'll take you home. She's looking at me like I'm a mystery, but she slowly makes her way to the bathroom while I give Chance Moore the location of my jeep and have him tow it to Rivers Auto. I'm exhausted. After Chance promises to call with a repair estimate later today, I remove my socks and pitch them in the trash. There's no saving them. Sliding onto my bed with my back against the headboard and my ankles crossed, I let my eyes fall closed. As usual, thoughts of Lily fill my head. I've spent more years hating her than not hating her, yet there's still no other woman I want in my bed. My hatred would probably disappear if I could also extinguish the love in my heart. Yes, I still love Lily. Maybe that's why I started the children's charity. Because it was something we dreamed of doing together, and it was my way of holding on to a piece of her. When I feel soft lips on mine, I think I'm dreaming. My eyes fly open. Lily is leaning over me clutching a towel, droplets of water on her chest and shoulders. Then the towel falls. She's flawless. Somewhere in the recesses of my mind, I know this is a bad idea, but I don't care right now. Not only is she the closest thing to perfection I've ever seen, but she's also had a starring role in my dreams and fantasies for years. I've stroked my cock to visions of her hundreds thousands of times, and if I don't fuck her right now, I'll go insane. God knows how many other men she slept with, but right now, I don't care. After years of lingering heartache, I deserve this. Pulling her closer, I flip her over me and onto the mattress then roll on top of her, pinning her beneath me. She lets out a little whimper when as I stare into her eyes, my hand reaches beneath her head and roughly grasps a fistful of her hair. The full weight of my body presses down on her and I grind my swelling cock against her mound. Lily, I breathe before closing my lips over hers. The pull between us is magnetic. I'm crazed with lust. For so many years I've walked around with a hollow ache in my chest that only this woman can fill, and I crave her like the air I breathe. Even if it's only this once, I have to have her. To hell with her hotshot fiancé and her career-driven ambition. Reaching back, I grab the collar of my shirt and pull it over my head before quickly sliding my cargo pants off and kicking them to the floor. Lily's breaths are labored and her eyes are hooded. Her legs part and my steel-hard erection presses against her slick folds. That's it. Take what you want, I tell her when her pelvis tilts closer and her legs wrap around my hips. She moans and lifts her chin as I nibble and suck down the tender flesh of her neck to her collarbone and breasts. I can't deny that everything I've built in the past four years, Bo's bunkhouse, the children's charity, this cabin, has been with Lily in mind. No matter where life takes me, she's always foremost in my thoughts. My tongue rolls over her pebbled nipple before I lean back to study her. I want to memorize every inch of her. You're so beautiful. My unshaven jaw has left redness on the porcelain flesh of her naked breasts, and my lips break into a grin when her eager hand reaches up, tangles in my hair, and pulls my mouth down to hers. Her pussy's soaked, and I can't wait any longer, but when I start to enter her she's so incredibly tight I can barely squeeze the head of my cock in. So I push harder. 
With one hard thrust, I break through a barrier and I'm fully seated inside her. A barrier? What the hell? Frozen, I stare into her eyes. She inhales sharply, and her eyes momentarily flare in alarm before a blush stains her cheeks. Don't stop. I'm good. She can't be. There's no way. Did I just? Lily. What? How? She shrugs as though it's no big deal. It's a big deal. It's a very big deal. Don't you dare stop. She hisses so I slide out and back in very slowly, letting her body get used to me before I pick up the pace. I'm so confused but her vaginal walls are squeezing the life out of me and suppressing all questions ricocheting around my head. When I hear her whisper, You're the only man I ever wanted. This is suddenly so much more than relieving sexual tension or a revenge fuck. It's everything. Chapter 9 Bo's mouth devours me, swallowing my moans and I cling to him, feeling as though I'm being swept away on a wave of euphoria. This is exactly how I pictured my first time, only it's better. Tingles ripple through me from my abdomen to my toes signaling my climax. Shudders rack my body and I stiffen, seized in the clutches of orgasmic intensity. Bo doesn't stop driving into me as I explode into a million tiny pieces. This. This is the climactic culmination of loving devotion followed by hate-fueled anger, a build-up over years, all for this man whom I could never erase from my thoughts. My neck arches and my head tips back. Cries of pleasure leave my throat as I ride the swell of ecstasy. Bo follows soon after, holding himself deep inside my body as jets of his hot seed fill me. My nerve endings continue to tingle. That was everything I'd hoped and more, and I can't help but be glad I waited. There's no one else I can imagine experiencing that with. When he rolls to the side, I lay melted on the mattress, boneless and motionless and nearly breathless. That was incredible, I say to the ceiling. I took your virginity. Welp figures he isn't going to let that go. When Bo places a kiss on the tip of my nose and wordlessly rolls out of bed, I'm not sure what to think. Is he angry I didn't tell him? What right does he have to be angry? Maybe he's not angry, he's just done. Now what? Now he gets dressed and takes you home, Lily, duh. I don't know what else I expected. He's attracted to me. Of course he is. He's a man. Sex means nothing to him. It certainly doesn't mean he cares about me. Lord knows he's probably been fucking other women the entire time I've known him. Still, I can't reconcile the lying cheat I know he is with the man who literally gave me the boots off his feet, who came running to protect me from a snake when I screamed, and who sat up all night to ward off woodland predators so I could sleep safely. From the time I finally confessed my feelings to Bo when I was 16 until, that night, I came to him with my problems. In all those times when I whined and complained about pageants or the antics of the other girls or my own insecurity, Bo never laughed or scoffed or told me I was silly. He listened and comforted me. He didn't see what I saw at first though. It took him longer to accept that we were destined. Turns out he was right back then. We're not destined. I hear water running. Maybe he's going to shower. But as I consider getting up and rummaging through his dresser to scrounge myself up something to wear, Bo returns. He scoops me into his arms, carries me into the bathroom, and places me gently in a warm bubble bath. Leaning over the tub, he brushes a sweat-soaked strand of hair off my forehead. There's still a conversation that needs to be had between the two of us. As I look away, he gets a clean sponge down from a shelf. Our eyes meet and I swear he stares straight into my soul. I want to know what's going on, goddess. How are you still a virgin? I shrug. I just... never wanted to. You know. I don't understand. You were supposed to be married, yet you never slept with your fiancé. Were you saving yourself for? No. I breathe out a long-suffering sigh. Fine. I'll tell you. I swallow audibly as I gather up my gumption. The wedding was a sham. A sham? I hired a fake officiant to perform a fake wedding ceremony. Why on earth would you do that? Because. Now I'm getting angry. I can't just drop it. He'll never let it go. I have to tell him. I have to say it aloud. Because I was trying to get over you. His brow furrows and he shakes his head in confusion. I'm not following. 
It's common knowledge that the best revenge on an ex is for them to see you happy, so I set up a huge wedding to take place here in Cottonwood Falls so you could see how happy I am. He starts to smile, then his face grows serious. Wait a minute, you did all of that for me. To rub your nose in it, I say, brushing my fingertips back and forth over the bubbles on the surface and not meeting his eyes. What about Eric Vandenberg? He's obviously not your lover. I sort of. Kind of. I stare at the water as my voice lowers to a barely audible mumble, blackmailed him. There's a moment of silence before Bo throws his head back and roars with laughter. I scowl. When he's done he wipes a tear from the corner of his eye and says, Never underestimate Lily Kane. Move forward, I'm coming in. I do as he says and as he slides in behind me with his legs on either side, his knees above the water, I get a close view of his injury. Two huge scars run along his leg at the knee and a few smaller ones pepper his calf and thigh. Though Abernathy always was bold and fearless. He was my rock. Until he wasn't. Which is why the pain of his betrayal was so intense. It blindsided me. My fingers run over the thick bands of scar tissue. It must have been terribly painful, I say. Excruciating, he says as he runs the sponge along my upper back and shoulders. But not nearly as painful as you ghosting me. Well, what did you expect after? After what, Lily? What could I possibly have done that was so unforgivable that you stood me up, left town and ignored all my calls, texts and emails for years? What? Tell me. I'm all ears. My arms cross angrily over my chest. How about got another woman pregnant? Chapter 10 I blink. And blink again. Several seconds go by while my higher cognitive functions work on processing what I've just heard. Are you honestly going to act like you don't know? She huffs out a frustrated breath. But I don't know. That night before your unit deployed? That night. That was the night that everything changed between us. Lily was supposed to meet me out on the bluffs after her dance class. I arrived early and had everything set up. An air mattress, blankets, pillows, tiki torches, the whole nine yards. I wanted our first time to be magical for her. And she never showed. No call, no text, no explanation. She cut off all communication for years. I'm still drawing a blank here, I say, my mood souring. Angie Weneman? She sneers. Oh shit. I have an idea of what she's talking about now, but... You saw her that night, didn't you? It's not a question, not really. I'd set up everything and was waiting for Lily to arrive, but instead of Lily, Angie showed up looking for me. I still don't know how she knew to find me on the bluffs, but she was crying about one of her many problems. All I remember was that it was terrible timing, and I got rid of her as soon as I could. You know, Angie was always spreading rumors about the two of you. Two of us? What does that mean? There was no two of us. Lily. I just thought Angie was a troublemaker. I ignored the rumors, and I didn't tell you because I didn't believe them. Not until I arrived at the bluffs that night and saw you two together. Well, together is not. You don't know how close I came to stomping over there, pulling a chunk of stringy hair out of her head and telling her to take her hands off my man. I can't fight a smile. That's my Lily. Why didn't you, goddess? Tears fill her eyes and it's a blow to the gut. I've known Lily most of her life and I can count on two fingers the times I've seen her cry. It sobers me quickly. Because I heard her say she was pregnant. I sit back like I've been slapped. And you thought? Seriously? I never touched Angie. Never. Well. Because that's not what she said. Yeah, she hit on me plenty of times, but that's Angie. I'm not the only guy she's tried to sink her hooks into. Angie slept her way around town so many times she probably has vertigo. Goddess, are you telling me that this... Estrangement. I let out a rough breath, trying to calm myself before I say something I can't take back. Was over a misunderstanding. I've been angry and bitter for years. Apparently we both have. Angie, Lily's brother Logan, Dean and I are all around the same age, and we're in the same grade in school. And yeah, Angie and I made out at a party once in high school, which would have made Lily anywhere from around 9 to 12 years old. Lily can't fault me for that, can she? Angie was like a rite of passage for some guys. 
Dean dated her briefly too. He may even have slept with her. Christ, I should have listened to him about Angie Weneman. Misunderstanding. She smacks the water with her fist so hard a splash lands outside the tub. I saw you two kiss. That was no misunderstanding, Bo. Kiss. I didn't. And then I remember. What you saw was her throwing herself at me and attempting to kiss me. Looking back, my mind scrambles to remember details. I run a hand through my hair. And that's the moment you ran off. Know how I know. Lily's chin tips up, and her eyes take on a look like she doesn't want to hear this, but she's going to. I know because what you apparently didn't see. But Lily doesn't wait for me to finish. I knew you would do the right thing and make an honest woman of her. Christ, I really regret not listening to Dean. Hey, I take Lily's chin between my thumb and forefinger and turn her head to face me. I'm not done and I need you to listen closely, goddess, and hear me. I wait until our gazes lock. What you didn't see was me peeling Angie off me, and telling her in no uncertain terms to keep her hands, and every other part of her, far away from me. But the baby. Her face contorts in pain, and I hate that my girl has been mired in this misconception for years. Did she lie about that too? No, she didn't lie about the baby. He's now a cute little kid named Bryce. He was named after his father, Bryce Walker. I stare pointedly. You may have heard her say she was pregnant but it was quite a leap for you to conclude that I was the baby daddy. Even as I say it, it dawns on me. Angie set it up to look exactly that way. I didn't know she'd been spreading rumors and lies about me being unfaithful. I can't say I'm thrilled that Lily so quickly and easily doubted us, doubted me. Then again, maybe it wasn't so quick. Sounds as though Angie was working steadily to break us apart the entire time Lily and I were together. Long-distance relationships aren't easy and I know how hurtful words can be and how they can, inch by inch, wear away even the most solid foundations. Wrapping Lily in my arms, I pull her back tightly against my chest and kiss the crook of her neck. Turning my anger and bitterness from Lily ghosting me to anger and bitterness over her lack of faith in us is pointless. I don't want to hold on to grudges. Not anymore. Because if there's anything that the past 24 hours have taught me, it's that this infuriating, resilient, tough-as-nails, crazy, scheming woman in my arms belongs to me, and she always has. Chapter 11 Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine a place like this. I step out of the freestanding tub onto heated flagstone floors, wrap a towel around myself and peek into the frameless glass shower enclosure. Multi-jets and a pebble-tile wall, impressive. The bathroom, like the rest of the place, is warm and rustic yet rather than feeling heavy it has an airy, spa-like quality. When Bo said cabin, I envisioned a one-room ramshackle hut with a warped wood stove, camping cot and cobwebby corners. My LA condo is a hovel compared to this place. As I enter the bedroom, I hear Bo clattering around in the kitchen fixing breakfast. My brain is still reeling. I haven't yet fully wrapped my mind around how different the past few years would have been if I'd arrived at the bluffs 15 minutes later that night. Or 15 minutes earlier. All this time, I've hated Bo for something that never happened. The smell of frying bacon wafts through the air and my stomach growls. I have to admit that the hurt and anger lit a fire under me. After high school, I stepped away from the pageant life, planning to attend Cottonwood Community College and study nonprofit management for our dream of setting up a children's charity. Instead, I ran away to pursue showbiz. It's amazing how hard a person works when they're trying to outrun misery and dejection. It was as if I had something to prove to the world. I'm Lily Kane and I'm good enough. For the past four years, I've been living a life I don't love because of a man I thought I hated. When I see the walk-in closet, I gasp. It's almost as big as the bathroom. Oddly, it's nearly empty. Rifling through the few hanging clothes, I bury my face in a button-down shirt and inhale the woodsy masculine scent before running a finger over the special forces patch on Bo's military uniform. I've lived my life to get back at Bo while he's lived his as a hero. Something niggles at the back of my brain, but my stomach growls again. Breakfast will probably be ready soon, so I dig through his dresser, slide on a pair of shorts and roll the waistband, then tug on a t-shirt that falls almost to my knees. I'm just about to close the drawer when I see a velvet jeweler's box. Which is none of my business. At all. But. Maybe just a peek. Does Bo have a woman in his life? It's been four years. He might. I won't jump to conclusions, but just a peek. 
I open the lid to find a stunning antique garnet ring. It's absolutely gorgeous but confusing. Garnets are my favorite stone. I had it in my pocket that night. I whirl around to see Bo leaning against the doorframe. The implication hits me full force and removing the ring, I turn it in my fingers and notice the inscription, Goddess. You, you were going to propose that night? He merely nods. Oh. I stop short because I don't know what to say. This may be the first time in my life that I'm truly speechless, so I close the box and place it back in the drawer between a Led Zeppelin t-shirt and a Kansas City Royals t-shirt. Bo's hand rests on my lower back as he wordlessly leads me into the open-plan living space and motions for me to sit at a granite-topped island. I stare at my plate of bacon and eggs considering my words before speaking. Bo, I... And then it hits me. That thing niggling at the back of my mind, and I draw in a quick breath. We weren't lost. I turn to face Bo, pointing an accusing finger in his face. We weren't lost, were we? Not only are these woods your backyard, but you were also special forces. There's no way you got us lost. Bo's faux contrite look is ruined by his quiet laughter. He's a terrible actor. I thought it'd be funny to watch you rough it in the wilderness. I should have known you'd manage just fine without your usual comforts. Even I was impressed. Mildly flattered by his compliment, I wave a hand in the air. Comforts? Do you have any idea how uncomfortable it is to stride down a pageant runway on six-inch stilettos, or take three back-to-back -back dance classes, or eat nothing but lettuce leaves for a week so you can fit into a skin-tight evening gown? It's inhumane. In truth, I had fun. I've never gone camping before, and I really wouldn't mind doing it again. And then I remember. Yesterday was supposed to be my phony but extravagant wedding, before I disappeared. My parents are probably frantic. I should call, but... Bo must read my thoughts because he says, I'll drive you home after breakfast if you promise not to grab the wheel. How? I totaled. I mean with your jeep still wrapped around a tree. I have a couple other vehicles in the garage out back. He's obviously doing okay for himself, and why wouldn't he be? I take a bite of eggs and practically moan aloud. They're delicious, and I dig in so diligently there's no conversation until I've cleaned my plate. As I chew my last bite, Bo takes my hand. Goddess, from now on I don't want there to be any misunderstandings or communication lapses between us. If one of us has a problem, we lay our cards out. Agreed? I nod. Agreed. As Bo rinses our plates and loads them into the dishwasher, I admire the river rock fireplace, exposed timber beam rafters and rustic plank flooring. If I were to design and decorate the perfect home, this would be it. I'm about to question Bo about the one thing I'm still undeniably curious about, the children's charity, when I happen to glance outside. What I see is scarcely believable. My feet move on autopilot, carrying me across the room to the floor-to-ceiling windows that look out onto a gorgeous view of the waterfall. Which means right now we're. This home is on. Oh my god. Bo built his home on the bluffs. This is our spot. Chapter 12 Lily's been silent, probably coming up with creative excuses to give her parents as to why she no-showed for her own wedding, but I want her to see this. Where are we? She asks as I pull into the parking lot. I'm uncharacteristically nervous, but she's waiting for an answer, so I clear my throat and give her one. Cottonwood Falls Children's Charity coordinates with outside organizations like those that grant wishes to chronically ill children college scholarship foundations, government social services, food banks, and Special Olympics-type organizations. But this, I gesture to the one-story building that was once an old schoolhouse, is the initiative I'm proudest of. Searching her face, I see genuine interest. We call it the Hangout. She removes her seatbelt, jumps out, and is halfway across the parking lot before I catch up with her. Keep in mind it's all still very new, I say as I hold the door, then enter behind her. It's a children's and teen center. Her eyes scan the brightly colored interior, and I usher her into a room on the left. Mr. Abernathy. A little girl comes running, and I swing her into my arms. Josie, how ya doin' little darlin'? Good. Miss Nicole is reading me Goodnight Moon. I wave to Nicole, one of our volunteers, then point out the shelves of donated books to Lily. This is our makeshift children's library. It's where younger kids come to have books read to them. We also have one for older kids. 
She watches as Josie runs back and settles on the beanbag chair next to Nicole. Lily shakes her head. Oh, this is amazing. Yeah. Come on, I'll show you the teen center. I take her hand and lead her down the hall. We're discovering that many junior high and high schoolers drop out or get behind in school when a parent is sick or working multiple jobs and they have to stay home to care for younger siblings. So we're coordinating with local schools and other social programs to offer remote learning as well as homework help, childcare, snacks, and meals. We step into a large room with sofas, a game nook, and pool tables. The moment we enter, Tyler Morris looks up and spots Lily. Holy shish, I give Tyler a stern look. Uh, I mean crap balls. It's Lily Kent. I've died and gone to heaven. Another boy clutches his chest with both hands and falls onto one of the couches, pretending to faint. The volunteer counselors as well as a group of teenagers who are shooting pool all drop what they're doing to gather around Lily. Can I have your autograph? Can I get a selfie? Lily not only graciously indulges every request, but she also asks their names and talks to each kid about their hobbies, likes and dislikes. Right here is Lily Kent in all her glory. Yes, she's a stunner, the whole world knows that, but only those who've seen her when she's dropped the walls of her sophisticated worldly exterior know that her external beauty doesn't hold a candle to what's inside. The snarky, sassy woman has raw, genuine heartfelt compassion beneath her steely exterior, and despite the whole wedding pretense, she's not as cold or calculating as she pretends to be. She had to grow a thick skin to survive pageant life, and it's probably one of the reasons she's so successfully navigated Hollywood. But beneath the tough as diamonds exterior beats a heart of gold. Oh how? How did you manage all this? She asks as she climbs back into the Land Rover. How? It was her idea. Back during a publicity maneuver for one of her pageants, she and the other contestants spent a few hours volunteering at a low-income children's center in Wichita. It was on that day that Lily's vision was hatched. Being a parentless kid myself, I was on board. We used to strategize for hours about it. I mean the funding. She turns in her seat. Well, I told you about the guy that I carried on my back after the IED explosion. Turns out his dad is loaded. He helped put me in touch with the right people, and he and his wife agreed to host an annual fundraiser and invite all their rich friends. It's still in its initial stages, but… I'm so impressed. Well, it wouldn't exist without you. Lily talks animatedly the entire drive to the Kent mansion. She waves her hands around exuberantly as she asks a million questions. It's not until we pull up that her excitement begins to wane. Rolling down her window, she waves to a security guard, signaling him to let us in, and I park in the turnaround opposite the front door. Lily stares at her fingernails but looks surprised when I open my door. Oh, what are… I can see the moment my intention dawns on her. You don't have to walk me in. I cock a brow. If she thinks I'm leaving her here alone with Mr. Big Wig Movie Director, she's mistaken. Mrs. Kent opens the door even before we reach it. Lily. What are you doing back so soon? Lily doesn't seem to know how to respond. She just stares open-mouthed at her mother. Then Mrs. Kent notices me. Hello, Bocephus. She smiles warmly. Thank you for your service. Hi, Mrs. Kent, I nod. You really don't need to say that every time you see me. She leans in and whispers, I know, but you're like one of my own children, and I'm very proud of you. Her words touch me more than she knows. Um. Lily and I were camping and well, she missed the wedding, I say with a shrug. Pathetic excuse, I know. Camping. Mrs. Kent's face twists into a mask of confusion. She glances at Lily, then at me, then back at Lily again. Wait a minute. You and Eric didn't elope. Elope? Lily and I look at one another questioningly. Well, yes, Eric disappeared too and we all assumed you two eloped. Lily's eyes bulge. Eric's gone? Chapter 13 So, you and Bo are together again, huh? Mia's smile lights up her face. That's amazing news. Amazing news is that I'm an aunt to an adorable little sweetie. Apparently, instead of celebrating my nuptials, the wedding guests celebrated the fact that my parents are grandparents. Turns out Mia has a three-year-old daughter, Emma, that no one knew about, and my brother Logan is Emma's father. Hey, at least the expensive food, floral arrangements and ice sculptures didn't go to waste. My parents are over the moon. No one's heard from Eric yet. 
I'm so happy for you. Mia tells me as I affix a tiara to my little niece's hair with bobby pins. It was all a misunderstanding, I say, filling her in on the Angie and that night story, substituting dummy words for expletives because, Emma. So what's that mean for the two of you? She asks. Are you in a relationship now? Committed? Well, yeah. Are we? I mean, sure. Aren't we? I guess. You used to be so upset about the rumors of Bo fooling around behind your back. They were all just nasty rumors, right? Well, I swallow. Yeah. I wish my voice held a little more conviction. Hey, princess. Logan enters the kitchen and scoops his daughter into his arms. Emma, who's dressed in a frilly pink princess dress, beams at her dad. Bo's not a player, then. I wish Mia would give it a rest already. No. He better not be. There's no way I could stick around Cottonwood Falls and watch Bo with other women. I'd rather go back to LA than have to go through that. Surely he feels the same. Maybe we should have put a label on our relationship. Suddenly I want to clarify things with Bo. Logan cocks a brow. Are you sure you're not being your typical, overly dramatic, hyper-romantic self, sis? Yes, I snap, not sure at all. Concern washes over Mia's features, but she quickly hides it. Hey, I say. Let's all go to Bo's bunkhouse. I'm sure mom and dad would love to watch Emma. Hell. I mean heck no. Logan says, grinning at his daughter. I'm not setting foot in that place again. Darn. I really want to clear this up with Bo and like he and I agreed to do, lay our cards out. How about you, Mia? We can have a ladies' night, just the two of us. I'm begging and I have no shame. She shakes her head but Logan shrugs and says, She's got a point, Mia. When's the last time you had an adult night out? Emma can stay with me. Emma nuzzles her little face against Logan. You sure? Mia looks apprehensive. Of Course I'm sure. She's my daughter. Right, Pipsqueak? He tosses Emma in the air and catches her while she giggles like crazy. It'll be fun, I tell Mia. Then, remembering she's been supporting both her and Emma on low wages, I say, you don't even have to go home and change. We can raid my wardrobe. When Mia and I enter Bo's bunkhouse, she spots a group of friends from high school, so we join them. My eyes immediately scan the place for Bo. He's in the middle of a crowd of women. My heart nearly beats out of my chest the moment my eyes land on him, until I see one of the women slip something into his pocket. I'm sure it's her number. Bo just smiles. What's he doing? A curvy blonde saunders over and puts her hand on his butt. I wait for Bo to tell her he's spoken for, but he doesn't. He just smiles at her before someone else engages him in conversation. What? Leaning toward Lindsay Butler, I ask, who is that woman? I point to the blonde butt grabber. Oh, that's Kimmy Daniels. She's a local realtor and a real man-eater if you know what I mean. Wives hold on to their husbands when she's around. Lovely, I mutter sarcastically. Then, a woman in a painted-on mini-dress with a killer push-up bra shoves her hand in Bo's pocket. Wait. Is that Shanna Niedermeyer? We were in dance class together. Bo gives her a friendly nod. I'm crushed. Like fragile glass, my heart shatters into a million tiny shards. Mia's right. We never claimed exclusivity and he may have been a one-woman man years ago, but now. Bo's a player. Wow. How quickly I'm tossed aside. Another drink and I'm out of here. Hey, Lily. Dean, Bo's identical twin, opens his arms and comes in for a hug, and despite my salty mood, I can't help but smile. I missed him. Dean. How are you? Great. Hi, Mia. Dean hugs Mia as well. Been a long time, ladies. It's good to see you both. The way he winks at me lets me know that Bo's already confided in him about our recent exploits. Against my will, my eyes land on Bo again, and of course, Dean notices because nothing's working out for me this evening. Excuse me, Dean says. I'll be right back. Dean heads toward Bo and his harem, but when his cell rings, he glances at the screen and detours in another direction. This is like a train wreck. I don't want to see it, but I can't look away. And just when I think it can't get any worse, Angie Weneman comes strutting over to our table. Well, hey there, Miss Hollywood. Heard your wedding was a bust. She smacks her chewing gum noisily. 
Guess it doesn't fare well for the rest of us when a pageant queen like you can't hold on to her man. Do not let her bother you. Do not let her bother you. I try not to, I really do, yet I can't help but wonder why she's here. Angie fluffs her hair. I'd stay and chit chat with y'all, but Bo's waiting for me, she says, chomping her gum like a cow chewing its cud. Right. Angie strides off, swaying her hips so hard it's a wonder she doesn't throw her back out. With a concerned look, Mia slides closer to me. Bo's waiting for her, huh? That's what she thinks, I tell Mia smugly. Watch, Bo won't have a thing to do with her. When Bo motions with his head for Angie to follow him into the back room, my face goes crimson. I'm in the middle of a nightmare. A pride-crushing, soul-destroying nightmare. Chapter 14 That highfalutin goody two-shoes ain't got no time for a country bumpkin like you. I rub the space between my brows where it feels like a steel spike is drilling into my skull. She'll dump your sorry ass when a juicy movie role comes along. That's all I've got to say. Thank God that's all she has to say, because I don't think I can listen to one more word out of Angie's mouth. She hikes her purse over her shoulder and marches through the swinging door. Good riddance. She argued that it's unfair to hold something against her that happened years ago, but while she did have a point, the long-lasting repercussions are still fresh. Who pissed in your cornflakes? Merv emerges from the cooler carrying a jar of olives. I just fired Angie. Put the word out that we're hiring, I say. In the meantime, I'll be picking up the slack. Reaching into my pocket, I pull out a bar napkin, a business card, and a scrap of scented stationery, all with women's phone numbers, and all stuffed into my pockets in the past few hours. In addition, Kimmy Daniels grabbed my ass and Alex Niedermeyer's younger sister made a pass at me. Sheesh, Alex's sister is barely old enough to drink. That shit's a nightly occurrence. I toss them in the kitchen trash bin. I used to hand them right back but quickly learned that a red-blooded man in his late twenties sparks outrageous gossip when he rejects every woman on the spot. After hearing rumors about everything from my supposed impotence to my junk being blown off in Afghanistan, I find it easier on my ego to play along with harmless drunken flirtations and wait until I get to the kitchen to empty my pockets. Still miffed, I push through the door into the dimly lit bar, plaster a grin on my face, and make my rounds, mingling with patrons conversing and buying a few drinks on the house. My breath catches when I spot Lily at a table near the back, and my foul mood vanishes. Why didn't she tell me she was here? For a moment, I just admire her. She's stunning. Lily always did light up the room. She's with some friends from high school, and when I head to their table, I'm wearing my first genuine smile of the evening. Hey goddess. You're a sight for sore eyes. Lily looks tense. Her smile is phony. I lean over to kiss her but she turns her head and my kiss lands on her cheek. Then without meeting my eyes she stands. What the hell? Johnny. Lily coos at John Atwater. You promised me a dance. And I swear to Christ she flutters her goddamn eyelashes at him. John leaps to his feet takes her outstretched hand and leads her toward the dance floor. Oh hell nah. I stop them before they've made it five feet, shooting John I look that has him taking a step back and raising both hands in surrender. If you're gonna dance with anyone, I tell Lily, pulling her roughly into my arms, it's gonna be me. You got that, I growl. It's not a question. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Merv's signal from behind the bar. His shift is ending and it's time for me to take over. I hold up a finger telling him to give me a minute. There's so much fire in Lily's eyes, it's like staring into twin flamethrowers. What's going on here? I ask. She wiggles and squirms. Let me go, Bo. No. What's the pissy mood for, goddess, and why didn't you tell me you were coming? That would have been nice for you, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I shrug. Hell, I'd have set the table up with complimentary mozzarella sticks or something. She stomps the pointy heel of her shoe down on my instep, and just as I relax my grip slithers out of my hold. What in the ever-loving? Merv waves again, and I shoot him a scathing glower. I was just leaving. Lily's mouth hardens and her nostrils flare. She's clearly pissed and I'm clueless. Thought you wanted to dance. I mean leaving town. I stare hard. She better not be saying what I think she's saying. Come again. You heard me. Her hands fly to her hips and her chin juts into the air. Just came to say goodbye before I head to LA. 
I was offered a movie role that I just can't turn down, and I booked the first flight home. She stresses the word home. Again, Merv waves. Can't he wait a fucking minute? Good luck, I bite out harshly. Matter of fact, break a goddamn leg. Then I watch as Lily turns on her heel and strides off. I know I should go after her, but Angie's words are ringing in my head. She'll dump your sorry ass when a juicy movie role comes along. Livid, I stomp through the kitchen toward my office. Once again, I've opened my heart to her, and she's ripped it from my chest. Dean's seated at my desk talking on his cell. His eyes widen when I kick my leather couch. Fuck. A jolt of crippling pain shoots up my leg. Let me guess. Dean ends his call, rounds the desk and sits on the edge with his arms crossed. Lily troubles. She's leaving town. My fist slams into the wall, leaving a gaping hole in the plaster. I hoped that would make me feel better. It doesn't. Dean looks disappointed. Why? This morning he said he was glad Lily and I are back together. What's the look for? I snap. Oh, I don't know, but I might run too if someone I was interested in was getting phone numbers shoved in their pockets and their ass groped. He shrugs. Just saying. Like a flip switch, my anger vanishes. Oh fuck. I run a hand down my face. You don't think. Oh, she saw it. Dean nods. My mind replays what she must have seen. It's not good. Christ, I wasn't thinking. That shit stops now. I'll find Lily. I'll explain. I'll grovel. Just then there's a knock on the door and Merv calls. Boss? Fuck. Dean? Sorry bro. He shakes his head. You know I'd cover for you, but I gotta fight in an hour. I heave a labored sigh. Probably better to let her cool down first anyway. Chapter 15 Dressed in Balenciaga casual wear and oversized Gucci sunglasses, I clutch my Hermes handbag in one hand and Louis Vuitton carry-on in the other as I stare out the huge windows of the airport terminal, not quite noticing the activity on the other side. Baggage handlers load and unload luggage compartments. Passengers embark and debark along jet bridges. My mind and heart are elsewhere. A part of me keeps hoping that Beau will come running through the concourse clutching a bouquet of red roses, calling out my name, and begging me not to leave. I know it's silly, but no amount of internal scolding can seem to keep me from looking up every few minutes, just in case. It's not until a gate agent announces that Flight 914 to LAX is now boarding first-class passengers that I lose all hope. Ah. What am I doing feeling sorry for myself? I despise self-pity. Loathe it. And here I am acting like a poor lovesick loser. With my head held high and my shoulders back, I walk briskly to the plane, pulling my carry-on behind me. Fortunately, I remembered to purchase two first-class tickets. I like my solitude, and the last time I forgot to purchase an extra ticket, I was seated next to a sleazy middle-aged businessman who drank too much, got up to use the restroom four times during a three-hour flight, and tried to cop a feel before finally falling asleep and drooling all over my shoulder. I just can't handle that right now. Leaning my head back, I keep my sunglasses on and close my eyes while I wait for the plane to take off. I'm just about to fall asleep when a question pops into my brain. Lily, have you learned nothing? I sit bolt upright as a realization dawns. I was blindsided by Bo's betrayal four years ago because the Bo I knew was honest and steadfast and loyal, yet instead of giving him the benefit of the doubt, I ran. Turns out he didn't betray me, and he was all those things. Only a day ago, Bo and I made a promise to each other that we'd talk things over before either of us went off half-cocked again, yet here I am on the first flight out, running away again because some skanky hose hit on my man. Who am I? My brother was right about me being overly dramatic and hyper-romantic. Here I am expecting Bo to come chasing after me. That's not me. I'm Lily fucking Kent. I didn't let countless auditions and hundreds of rejections stop me from getting the lead role in an Eric Vandenberg movie, and I didn't win Miss Cottonwood Falls Pumpkin Festival six years running by sitting on my ballet tap and jazz dance toned butt. No, I worked for it. I am a fighter, damn it. Unbuckling my belt, I grab my handbag, stand, and begin searching the overhead bins for my carry on. Ma'am? A flight attendant appears at the rear of the first class cabin. Please be seated and fasten your safety belt. I ignore her, snap the overhead bin shut, and move on to an adjacent one. Where is my carry-on? 
Ma'am? The flight attendant is more insistent now. Her fists are planted on her hips. Ma'am, please be seated. I glance at her name badge. Julie. Listen, Julie. I lean in so we're almost forehead to forehead. I have a dire emergency. It's a matter of the heart. I tap a spot over my left breast, slide my sunglasses to the top of my head and give her puppy dog eyes. I made a huge mistake, and I need to get off this plane right now if I have any hope of having a future with the man I love. Julie looks sympathetic, she does but she shakes her head. I'm sorry, but the plane is already taxiing to the runway. It's not possible for us to stop the flight at this point. My heart falls. I truly am sorry. Julie places a hand on my arm consolingly. But I'm going to have to insist you take your seat. Right, I say around the lump in my throat. It's my own fault, Julie, I mumble, sinking into the window seat with my head pressed against the glass. I don't know how long I sit like that, but I'm staring out at the tops of fluffy white clouds wishing I could get out and walk on them. I'd run back to Cottonwood Falls. A passenger sits in the paid-for empty seat beside me, but I don't have the energy to ask them to move. Don't cry, goddess. The voice sends a shiver all the way to my toes. My head whips around and my mouth falls open as I gaze at the most glorious sight I've ever seen. I don't even realize I'm crying until Beau brushes a tear from my cheek. What, what are you doing here? I say on a sob. He shrugs. I figured I'd do some sightseeing in LA, and maybe I could talk a gorgeous blonde goddess into packing up her thing selling her condo, and moving to the cabin I built for her out on our special spot on the bluffs of Cottonwood Falls, Kansas. He wants me to move in with him? Because I'm actively crying now, I nod as I dig in my handbag for a tissue and blow my nose before I speak. You came for me. Oh my god, romantic dreams do come true. When you ran last time, I wasn't able to come after you. Uncle Sam was calling. That's no longer the case. From here on out, there's nowhere you can go where I won't chase you. Your career can still flourish if your home base is in the wilderness, can it? Actually, I say with a watery laugh. I was hoping maybe I could trade it in for an executive position at Cottonwood Falls Children's Charity. The position's yours, Bo says, causing my heart to melt and my tears to flow harder. It wouldn't exist without you. He pulls me against his chest, stroking my hair. Hush now, goddess. I'm sorry, Bo, I hiccup. I'm sorry I left. I knew you'd be back. You did. How? One, because you left without this. Bo slides the antique garnet ring on my finger. And two, he says as he brushes a tender kiss on my lips. Because you and I, Lily Kent, are destined. We hope you have enjoyed this computer-generated audio production of Only Lily by Una Rida. To ensure these authors are able to bring you more free content, please support them by subscribing to this channel.